All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a pretty crazy day. Here we are the last couple Sundays. If you've been joining us, we've been uh, going using Facebook stream, but from our church building. And here we are, you see me sitting in my house and you're in your house too. Uh, and oh, maybe in your pajamas, maybe with a cup of coffee sitting there. But here we are. So uh, I am so glad to be here today. I just wanna say it's been a long couple weeks a long month i'm sure you feel the same way and it's been so awesome to gather and so uh anyways this is what we're doing because of the uh order last week to stay at home we unfortunately couldn't do our sanctuary streaming that we've been doing and we are here in our home and so today's gonna look a little bit different i'm gonna be speaking from right here and it's just gonna be me today uh our music unfortunately was not able to work out and so we still have a couple things we're looking into looking to see if we have the tools, the resources, the systems, all those things to be able to produce the music. And so hopefully we can have that next week. Might look a little different than normal. Maybe it's a pre, pre, pre-recorded, excuse me, uh, type or maybe something different. We'll see. But anyways, uh, hopefully to follow up on that. Um, so because this is really our only touch point in the week, I do want to say just a number of things before I launch into the message. Uh, because uh, this is the one time we get talking the week. So, and I'm talking to a computer, it feels like, and to just my notes here on the screen. And so I want to say bear, bear with me here as we, as we use this platform today. But I want to say a couple of things before we get started. So first is that I really missed you guys. Um, it's been so hard to be away from people, from you, uh, seeing you, giving you a hug, a high five, a handshake. And uh, I'm sure you feel the same way. That just know that you're missed, uh, you are loved, and I'm so excited when we can get back together, not virtually, but in person together. So really looking forward to that. It's been funny, I've talked to a couple people this last week who, you know, you see someone on a walk and rather than having the, the quick 30 second, hey, how's it going? Those now are 10 minute conversations with people because we're so starving for social connection. Uh, so anyways, miss you guys a hey, ton with that. Um, second thing is I really want to encourage us right now as a church to press hard into our elder regional structure. If you've been with us for a while, you know the way that we're uh, organized as a church uh, in regards to providing ministry care and prayer support is through our elder regional structure. We broke out our church into four regions, north, south, east, and west, with an elder responsible for each region for prayer support, ministry care, those kinds of things. And this is the time right now to press into that. Um, I'm only one person and not able to care for every person, of course, in the church. And I don't think that's really what God wants. Uh, he wants us to equip each other for ministry. So I want to encourage you to do that. If you're looking for help, for assistance, for need, uh, give your elder a call. Or even if you just want to talk with someone for 20 minutes, give your elder a call. They would love to talk with you, to, to pray with you, to help you. So I really want to encourage us to press into our regional elder structure in this time. Um, third thing, so we have had uh, previously on our Sundays with our uh, Facebook live stream, we've had anywhere from 30 to 35 views on there. But I mentioned last week, we are up around 700 views on our Facebook live stream now. So uh, not just a couple more, but many times more. And so I want to encourage you to send this out to your friends, um, send the link, send the page out to friends, neighbors, coworkers. What a great chance to send to something, to send to someone who doesn't know know Christ. And so I want to encourage you to, to do that. Obviously, God is using this platform to be able to connect and get the gospel out to a lot more people, maybe than even on a Sunday at our church. And so uh, I just want to encourage you to send this out and give people as much access as uh, possible. Uh, another thing. So hopefully you're getting my updates on Wednesdays. I've been sending out the email to the whole church on Wednesdays. I know it's a little longer of a document, but I am uh, wanting to do that rather than multiple emails throughout the week. So that's kind of our update that we give regarding our response, what ministries are doing, plans for the future, those kind of things. So again, please uh, take a look at that. If you're not getting that for some reason, you can send an email to info at arborheights.org info at arborheights.org and we can get you set up and make sure we have your email on our church uh, email list. Okay, next thing. Um, new thing this last week, if you didn't see in the letter, we now have a YouTube channel. Yes, we have a YouTube channel. Thank you, Mr. Ken Weinbrenner, 
who got that going for us. That's so awesome. So last week's sermons posted on there. Uh, this week will be, and then other additional videos that we can put up can be now on our YouTube channel, which is great because you don't have to be a member of Facebook to view it. Um, anybody can go to YouTube and view it. And so uh, we're there as Arbor Heights Community Church on, Fa on YouTube. Look it up and our channel will come up and you can check us out and we'll continue to have content up there uh, as we move forward. Um, next, uh, list last week, if you missed it, we had our first ever virtual prayer night. Uh, it was awesome. We use Zoom as our platform and you could do both video and audio. And so we had about 20 or so people join in and what a great time. I mean, so many people, I think just connecting was great. And then if there's anything needed in this time right now, it's prayer. Uh, it is prayer. It is us praying to God, um, seeking him, loving him on behalf of our community, on behalf of our church. And so what we're going to do actually is we're going to start to do these every Wednesday for the next number of weeks. Uh, we feel like this is so important. And Christy Crispin, who led us last week, did, did great and is up for leading us in the future. And so this Wednesday, 7 p.m., we'll send another Zoom link and we'll just keep doing this every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And Christy will lead us and uh, we'll continue bringing ourselves before the Lord with that. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, next is uh, the preschool ministry highlight. So hopefully you saw that on Friday. I sent that out along with the announcements. Uh, Loretta Kimball, our preschool director, sent that out. There's a little video to go with it. That's pretty, pretty cute. And then a highlight from her. That would have been a, the normal thing this Sunday to give a ministry highlight. And so I wanted just to, uh, to, to remind you of that. Uh, another thing, I know there's a lot of announcements, but again, it's our only touch point. So I want to get as much as I can out there. Um, uh, so we found out of a really great need through our partnership with Ar Ar Arbor Heights Elementary. Uh, you know that we have a partnership with the school there and we do all kinds of different things. And we asked them during this crisis, hey, how can we help? How can we serve? And they let us know just on Friday that they have a need for uh, grocery gift cards. They have a number of families who are lower income or who have lost jobs and are in need of help with groceries. And so what a great way we can fill this gap. And so I want to throw that out there to us. Um, if that's something that you could do, uh, there's a couple options. Uh, first, uh, Charnel Bolger is the per who's, person who's in charge of our partnership. And so you'll see on the screen right here, I think it is the PowerPoint in front of you that uh, Charnel's email and phone number, and you can get a hold of her right there. And so what it is, is that if you're someone who doesn't want to get out of your house and leave, uh, you can give uh, to this. So through our website or through the um, cash app on the mobile phone or to mail in a check and just put community service project. And those funds will go to provide grocery gift cards. Um, if you're someone that wants to go out to the grocery store and, and you get groceries and you can pick one up, you can drop it off in the mailbox at the church building. Again, you can mail it to, to the church. So a couple options right there, but we'd love to have uh, as much help as we can to provide for families over the school. So again, con uh, contact Charnel and she can help you with any of the specifics on that. So thank you for doing that, for helping out. Uh, last couple quick things is uh, just practical for today. I've got my headphones in. Once you know, I'm not listening to music uh, as I'm preaching. Uh, these are to help with feedback and to uh, noise and all that. So have that on. Also too, if you're joining us today via Zoom, which we have both the Zoom platform and Facebook live stream, if you're using Zoom, we uh, um, have you automatically muted. Uh, but if you unmute yourself, uh, you will wind up being on the Facebook live stream recording. So I want you to know that. So I would strongly encourage you, do not un un unmute yourself, uh, stay muted and, and everything will go well. Uh, last thing is, you know, this platform we're using here where I'm in my home and you're in your home and most likely in your pajamas, uh, this feels less like a formal sermon and more like a fireside chat. Uh, it feels like that. It feels like kind of like we're in each other's homes, just sitting on the couch, uh, chatting about stuff. So today's message, while I am going to do a, a normal message, uh, it may look a little different or feel a little different. And you'll have to forgive me too if I have to toggle things. I'm going off my, my computer screen with my notes. So I may have to, to work here a little bit with that to make sure it all connects. So anyways, um, this will be a little more informal today and more like a fireside chat. So let's get into the message, but first let's go ahead and pray before we do that. Jesus, we, we love you, Lord, and we need just to calm our hearts right now. Calm our spirits, calm our, uh, calm our souls, our minds, God, um, everything going on. That's happening in our world, in our country, and in our families, in our homes, and then most likely even in our, heart, in our, in our own hearts. God, will we just slow down 
so we can hear you, Lord. And uh, Father, we know that there's so much going on, Lord, and so many voices that are uh, just yelling at us, whether on the news or newspapers or even in our own, in, in our own home, God. And, but most importantly, we want to hear your voice today. We want to be able to stop. We want to be able to hear what you've got to say to us. Uh, we know that you are speaking. You're always speaking, God. And so we want to hear what it is that you've got to say to us today, Lord. Lord. And um, God, I just want to pray for those in our church right now who have uh, been affected by this virus, God. Those who are sick, um, those who have a family member who's sick, those who have reduced work hours, those who've lost jobs, uh, those who are struggling to figure out what it's going to look like, those who are in a pretty tough home environment right now, God, I just want to pray for all of them, Lord. I pray that they would know that, as you say in the, in, in the Psalms, that you are close to the brokenhearted and to those crushed in spirit, and that they would know, Lord, that you're with them in the middle of all this, God. You do not abandon us in times like this. In fact, you draw near as we draw near to you, and so may they know, Lord, that you're a comfort for, for them, that you are walking with them in this valley, God. And so I pray that they would know that, Father. Um, I pray that they would continue to put their hope in you and in what you're going to do, God, that we would know that you are great, that you are good, um, that you are God in the midst of all this, Father, even despite what we see or feel or think. And so we just, uh, again, declare uh, publicly, God, our trust in you and our faith in you, Lord God. Lord, I ask for the technical piece today that it all goes well. We don't have any hiccups and everything goes smoothly, Father. I thank you for the technology we have to be able to communicate in this way. Uh, that we're not totally cut off from community, but we have the beauty of being able to connect uh, this way. So thank you for that, God. And we love you. And I just pray you'd use my words today, Lord Jesus, even though a little bit over a different platform, a different meeting, that you would use them in a powerful way, God, to transform us and change us as a church, Lord. Uh, we love you and we submit ourselves to you over this next time. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, so if you're with us for the first time, uh, or if you're coming to us online from somewhere not part of our church, I want to just want to say welcome. Uh, welcome to Arbor Heights Community Church. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.arborheights.org, to find out more information about us, who we are, our ministries, our beliefs, all those kinds of things. So I want to welcome you to go check it out. But we've been going through a series for a little bit over a month now called um, The Things I Wish Jesus Hadn't Said. Things I Wish Jesus Hadn't Said. Now, I don't know about you, but this series has been really good. Uh, there's been things I've been thinking about over the years that I, I think to myself, I really wish Jesus had never said that. I like my lifestyle. I like what I'm doing. Uh, I wish it was different. But in learning what Jesus had to say to us, I'm so grateful he did. I'm so grateful he said the things that I didn't like because that's what I needed to hear. And I hope you feel the same. But I do have some bad news because we're going to take a break from our sermon series today. Uh, we're going to take a break from it, and we're going to address this whole pandemic around us. And I've felt for a number of weeks this is something that we need to do. As Christians, of course, we hold our Bible in one hand and the culture in the other. And we need to be both students of our Bibles and students of culture so we can connect the two. And so uh, I think it's important and timely that we have a word and say a word about where's God in all this and, and what's going on and a response to this uh, virus and to the pandemic and all that. And so that's what I'm going to do today. Um, it's a little bit different, but uh, that's what I feel that God's put on my heart and I've been thinking a lot about and praying a lot about. And so that's what we're going to do. And I want to say too, I recognize there's a lot of things that could be said about this. And so we only have four hours today. Okay. We have less than that. Uh, so I'm going to just focus in on one aspect. And the title of today's message is An Inconvenient Savior. An Inconvenient Savior. Um, you know, it, it's been really interesting to uh, hear and, and see from different Christians the uh, responses or uh, understandings or beliefs about where God is in this whole pandemic. I don't know if you've heard people talk to you, but I've heard a lot of different opinions and thoughts about where God is, but I, I really it's kind of boiled down to three areas, and I want to tell you what those are. So the first is this. I've heard some people talk about it, that this is the work of Satan, that uh, it's uh, Satan, right? And in the book of John, it says that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So this is his work, to, to destroy, to tear apart, to damage our world and our country, and so that's what some people believe. Um, I've also heard that this is God's punishment right? This is sort of like going back to 9-11, to where a common narrative was that 
This was divine punishment, divine justice on a country who has abandoned God, who's forsaken God, who's left God. And so I've heard people say that, that this is a punishment from God to discipline our world and nation for forsaking him. Um, I've also heard from people who are not Christians that, right, that who believe that there maybe is no God. Uh, and this is the opportunity for the human race to really rise up, uh, to really uh, dig in and uh, bear into the human potential and really show what humans are capable of. And so it's a time for humanity to become its best and rise up and, and uh, get out of this. And so I've heard people say that one as well. Um, but I want to challenge us today with a possible different understanding of maybe where God is in all of this. And in doing that, I, I want to mention as well, I think a couple of responses that we tend to have in times like this, in times like crisis, right? And what I've heard a lot is, is these two things, is number one, is let's get through this as fast as possible so we can return to normal life. Maybe you've heard that, or maybe that's what you've been thinking too, uh, right? And this is actually what Governor Inslee said last week in his proclamation on Monday. He said one time, quote, that we need to get through this as quick as possible and then return to normal life. And yes, to a certain degree, that's absolutely true. I mean. Which one of us doesn't want to get back to a normal job and kids back in school, right? And some of the structure of life and, and all that and, and getting healthy again, right? I mean, we all would agree that's a good thing. But there's this tendency in us that uh, we want to quickly get through the crisis or the difficulty and just get me back to normal life, right? I think that's one response. The second thing is this, is that whenever we go some, through something like this, I think almost always, and I know people say you shouldn't use the word always, but I think it's appropriate. We always think of these things as bad things. Anything that disrupts, that hinders, that pauses, that limits, that reduces our lives, that, that interrupts our lives, we see as a bad thing, right? And maybe you're thinking, well, I don't, John. Well, let me give you a couple examples, right? Uh, when you've had someone who has interrupted your day, uh, who has come and asked a you know, request of you or has asked a need of you, uh, when is the uh, last time that your first response to that has been, um, God must be doing something for my good today? I, uh, probably not. Probably not. It's probably annoyance, frustration, leave me alone, let me get back to my plans, right? Or how about this? How about when's the last time you were driving to work in the morning on I-5 and someone cut you off and your first response was, thank you, God, for this gracious opportunity to practice patience, Right? When would you ever, no, you'd be yelling at the person, screaming at the person, uh, some of us cursing at the person, right, who cut us off. And so we always think of things that disrupt our lives, uh, slow down our lives as bad things, as negative things, right? But I want to suggest a radical alternative to where God is in this. I want to suggest that maybe this is not a punishment, maybe this is not the work of Satan but this is a gift from God. This is a gift from God. Now, before you start throwing tomatoes at the computer screen, before you send me a nasty chat through Zoom and say what a jerk, before you unplug and turn off your Facebook, uh, let me explain, let me unpack what I mean here, right? Um, what I mean is this, is that whenever you see in the Bible, uh, God do this, God strips away in times like this our dependencies he, he restricts our freedoms and he shifts down everything in our lives to the bare essentials as a gift to us, as a way to grow us, as a way to teach us things about him. I'll say it like this. God slows us to save us. God slows us to save us. The Bible teaches that in times like this, in a crisis that we're going through, God doesn't see these things so much as problems to get rid of, but as seasons for shaping. Seasons for shaping, conditions for character. All right? He sees them not as times that we need to run from, but to run to, actually. That's how crazy, right? I mean, to tell people that right now, we need to not run from the pandemic, but to into this season that we are going through. Let me give you one example, and I thought of this earlier. To talk about things I wish Jesus hadn't said. This is something I wish Paul had never said. Uh, this inconvenient word in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 
verses 8 through 10, and I'll read this for you. It says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffer in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, our hearts, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But, here it is, this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Paul says that we have had hardships. We have suffered. We are under great pressure. Who doesn't feel like there's a lot of pressure right now, right? Uh, we are feeling the sting or the feeling of death far beyond our ability. Who doesn't feel beyond their abilities right now? And Paul's word is, all this happened, or God orchestrated all of it, so that why we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. It was a season of shaping. And this is what God does in times like this. Folks, it is not so much, I don't think, a punishment as it is a gift. The Bible in times like this asks the question over and above anything else, what is God up to? What is God up to in times like this? So I think maybe the better question to ask in this season is not, when will this be over? But God, what are you wanting me to see about myself or about you that I haven't seen before? What if that was our question right now? God, what are you wanting me to see in this season about myself or about you that I haven't seen before? You know, let me just clarify here as we get into the message here today, because I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying, because that's very important, right? The, the thing that I'm saying is, and let me be clear, uh, I'm not saying that this pandemic is a gift from God. I'm not saying COVID-19 is a gift from God, because clearly what the Bible teaches is that sickness, disease, things of this nature are not a product of God, but are a product of sin. That, it, that God created our world not to be a place. In the book of Genesis, at the very beginning, it's a perfect world. It's a world where there is no disease, there is no sickness, there is no death. But it enters in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And it's in that that it not only fractured their own selves and relationships, but our world. And so in comes disease, in comes sickness, in comes death, in comes all these things. And God says, at the end of all time, when I restore all things, there will be no sickness. There will be no injuries. There will be no death. There will be no viruses. And so I want you to clearly hear me. I'm not saying the pandemic itself is a gift. I'm saying this season is a gift. I'm saying this time of the virus is a gift. And I also want to be clear to you, I, I hope I don't come across today, and please, this is not my uh, a motivation at all, is to be calloused or indifferent towards those of us who are going through a hard time. Some of us have a loved one who's sick right now, and this is a, a, a time of concern, right? Some of us just found out we lost our jobs. We just got laid off. Some of us uh, got our hours reduced at work. Some of us are having a really hard time at home. Some of us are unbelievably lonely. And, and please don't hear that, that God doesn't care about that or that God, uh, all he wants to do is just shape us and he give a rip about how we're actually doing. No, no, God cares deeply for this. He says he wants to comfort us in this time. He wants to come and meet us in this time that God cares about that we do get back to jobs and we do get back to health. God cares about those things deeply, right? But, but my concern is that that will be our only focus and we will miss what God wants to do in us and through us in this time. That's what my concern is, is that God would slow us to save us and some of us would miss the saving. But God wants to do a rescue in our hearts more than he wants to do a rescue in our bodies, right? That's what he wants to do. You know, it was interesting. This really came to light even yesterday when uh, our family was out walking our dog and we ran into some old neighbors of ours who live down the street and they have three kids. And so they have kids at home too. And we were talking and they were sharing about this time. And we were saying about how with our kids in school and, and what's going on and, and all this. And at one point they said this though, without us prompting it, they said, you know, this has been so good for our family as we're not working and, and, and kids are not at school and 
Everything's kind of closed down. They said, we've had uh, dinners together. Uh, they said, last night, we were in our family room, and we got to uh, watch our, our daughter dance for a half an hour in the family, just watched her dance. And, and the one spouse said to the other, you know, when's the last time that we sat here and just watched our daughter dance? And the one person said, I don't think ever. I don't, I can't remember a time. I think it was always dance for one minute, then let's hustle up and get to dinner. And then we got to get you to soccer practice. And then tomorrow morning, we got to get ready for this. And there's homework tonight and there's this, right? And we were always running everywhere, going all different kinds of things. And it was when we finally had to slow down that we had this moment of joy. We had this moment of being a family. We had this moment where we could love each other. And it was such a beautiful reminder from people that God slows us to save us. God slows us to save us, to save us from ourselves, to save us from all the things that we run to other than him. He slows us down to save me. And, and heaven forbid that we would get out of this pandemic and we'd go back to normal. I pray we don't. I pray we go back to change people, that we are different people when we come out of this. You know, here's the ugly truth I think probably a lot of us don't want to hear in this, is that I think what this season has revealed is that we care much more about our comfort than we do our character. We care a lot more about our happiness than we do our holiness. And this is why we have such a hard time of hearing this as a gift. This is why when I said that, I think a lot of us recoiled or struggled, right? Because we care so deeply for our comfort and we want so badly for our lives to be safe and to be organized and to be soft and cushy and to go according to plan right? But God cares so much more for the opposite. God wants the formation of our character. God wants our holiness. God wants us to look like Jesus. That's what he wants. And I don't know about you, but rarely, if ever, those uh, things in my life have come through ease and comfort. Almost always those things have come through difficulty, through trials, through suffering, through uh, not having the answers, through things being way beyond my abilities, through, through times of me being annoyed and frustrated and having to confront things in my own lives or, or, or in my own life, that's when it's come. God cares so much more about our character and our holiness than he does our comfort or happiness. You know, I think too, this has also been a, a time where we've had all the, the trappings and the scaffolding and all the things that prop up our lives come to, uh, toppling down. And we've had to face or confront the difficult questions that we have a wanted to face, isn't it? I mean, all those lingering questions in the back of your mind that you never wanted to answer and that you thought you could just suppress and push down, is not this the time where God confronts us in this? Isn't it the time when uh, I begin to have to look in the mirror and ask the questions about who am I? What am I doing with my life? Why am I so busy? What am I running from and what am I running to? Do I really know God at all? Am I just doing things for God, but I don't know him? All these questions that, that we wrestle with and that we put off and so many people, frankly, go to their graves never answering. Now's the time to answer them because they define everything else in life. So I want to encourage you, don't push back the questions. Don't try and push back the wave that God's bringing. Welcome it. It's a gift. It's his grace coming to you to say, I love you. And I want to free you. And I want to rescue you. I want to save you. Slow down so you can be saved. That's what God's wanting to speak to us, I think, right now. You know, we've been forced to return to our homes. And I know probably almost all of us now, maybe are getting cabin fever, maybe getting stir crazy, right? I think all of us are saying, just get me out of the house for at least a half an hour, hour to give me a break. But if what's interesting is this is not the first time something like this has ever happened. I don't know if you realize that, but uh, thousands of years ago in the book of the, uh, in the book of, in the, in the Bible, excuse me, the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 25, every 50 years were required to return back to their homes. It was called the year of Jubilee. Let me read to you the description in Leviticus chapter 25. If you have a Bible, you can flip it open right now with your coffee and your pajamas. Uh, just a side note to you, since I can't see you right now, and I'm just looking at my screen, don't feel bad if you have to go to the bathroom or hop up and grab a snack break. Uh, I won't be offended or hurt. In fact, I won't even know. Okay, Leviticus chapter 25. 
verses 8 through 13. And let me read this. It says, count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 40, excuse me, 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. That's really interesting too, the day of atonement. That's the one day during the Jewish year where they would put their hands on a goat and they would sacrifice a goat. And then they would send one goat out into the woods as a symbolism of taking their sin and putting it on this other lamb or goat. So it would be sacrificed for them, symbolic of in the New Testament, Jesus being the one who did that. So I love that this connection of resting, stopping all the stuff, going to your homes is connected to Christ's work on the cross for us, meaning slow down and rest in what Jesus has done for you because that's what really counts, okay? It says, consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family family property and each to his own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to his own property. So there you go. There is a time where uh, God says, stop. God says, stop. God says, uh, stop everything. Stop what you're doing. Stop businesses. Stop schools. Stop religious feasts. Stop the, the, the synagogue. Stop all of it. Close it all down and go home. Right? The, it's so funny. The very exact thing that we are doing. They did every 50 years. They would stop all they're doing, all their business, and return to their homes. And here's what I find amazing. Here's what I find incredible. What did God call this year? The year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. Notice, not the year of annoyance. Not the year of avoidance. Not the year of a nuisance, but the year of Jubilee. Jubilee is to celebrate. So this is going to your homes, being closed up in a house with your family, not working. All these things God is saying is a gift. It's to celebrate because why? Not just simply the returning home, but what God's going to do. What's God going to do? And primarily what is right there, he's going to remind us to rest and remember God's done all the work for you to turn us back to Christ, right? He's going to slow us to save us. Slow us to save us. You know, I, I say this as well, and I just, I, I want to be clear again. Uh, I, maybe I'm saying it multiple times, but I, I, this doesn't uh, negate, and I don't want to negate the reality of that some of us in our homes uh, don't have family. Uh, some of us uh, do not have healthy families. We have dysfunctional families. And so uh, some of us, the last thing we wanted to be was be back home. And so I I get that. And I just want to say, I understand that I'm not meaning um, that everything is fine or that uh, it's all going to be great or that every family life is going to be wonderful. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is even in the dysfunction, even in the hardship, even in the loneliness, God is saving us. God is turning us to himself and doing something in it. So I want to ask today, and I want to spend the rest of our time looking at um, two things I think God is rescuing us in or rescuing us from. And here's the first one. It's an opportunity to become human again. It's an opportunity to become human again. You know, it, it is in this, I think, that God is reminding us in this time of the virus that life is not about doing, but about being. Isn't it? What a great reminder that life is not about doing, it's about being. But here's the problem. We always live the opposite. We always think it's about doing, and then my doing defines my being. But the gospel is, my being defines my doing, right? Again, it's my resting in Christ. It's my being that then defines what I ought to be doing. And so God, I think, is rescuing us, saving us. He's giving us back our humanity by saying, stop doing all this stuff. Stop trying to define yourself by the striving, the going, the busyness, the accomplishments, the achievements. Everything we're all trying to run for and run to, God's saying, stop and just return back to being with me, to a relationship with me, because that's what it's all about. And I want to give you your humanity back. I want to give it back to you. 
God slows us to save us. God slows to save us. You know, I was thinking about it, and I mentioned in our prayer meeting this last Wednesday night, in the last three months, um, I've laughed more in this past month than I've laughed in the last three years. Seriously, I've laughed so much. We've been laughing at the dinner table. We've been laughing out in the trampoline. Uh, we've been laughing in the car. Uh, we've been laughing at night when we're going to bed. I mean, we've been laughing so much. I've been laughing at all the kind of, in fact, a couple nights ago, putting my younger daughter to bed, she had to tell me when, when I was tucking her in to stop laughing. I was laughing so much about something she did. It's been hilarious. And, you know, you might think, well, that's kind of a superficial thing, John, that God's been teaching you this whole time is to laugh more. But you know what? For me, I think what it's been is an indication of something deeper in my heart. I think it's been a, a, a communication by God or revealing of God a, a, of a lightness of spirit. And for someone like me who's, I'm so driven, I'm so focused on every minute of the day, I got to be doing something, you know, making every minute count that God's telling me, John, stop taking yourself so seriously right? You're not that, that a big a deal. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Lighten up, let go of things, and let me do my thing, and focus on, on people and, and your family, and just enjoy the time. You don't have to be doing a bunch of things, and I think out of that work in my soul, it's produced a lot of laughter, and I feel like God's given me a part of my humanity back in this. He slowed me to save me, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, uh, Ephraim Radner, an author, says this, we see the way as societies we have allowed our personal lives to become enfolded in and seemingly dependent upon intricate and vast networks of collective construction that have diminished our humanity, diminished our humanity. All this running, this striving, this accomplishing, this hoarding, this amassing, this exhaustion, all the things that, dis that define most of our lives have produced this diminished humanity. It's stripped our humanity from us. It's made us something that we were never designed to be by God. And I feel like this pandemic has given us a chance to come back and be more human. You know, the truth is, is that I could do a 10 week series on what it means to be human, right? I mean, this is such a huge topic and it underlies so much of the cultural questions that are happening around us is what does it mean to be human? Right? So we don't have time to go into that today, and that could be such a long thing, and maybe we should do that as a church, and that'd be awesome. But what I want to say today is, is when Jesus was asked in the Bible to boil the entire Bible down to just two things, he boiled it down to this, Matthew 22, 36 through 39. A teacher uh, asked him, which is the, or a guy asked Jesus, the teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I think fundamentally that's what it means to be human, is to love God with everything I've got in me and to love people like Jesus has loved me. That's what it means. That's what it means to be human. And what's interesting is in Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee, that as God brought them back into their homes, these are the two things you see stick out in this passage loving God and loving other people. Let me give you some examples, right? The, the first one, uh, bringing them back to God in this time. Leviticus 25, 17, uh, do not take advantage of each other, but fear your God. I am the Lord your God. Uh, verse 36, do not take interest of any kind from them, fear, but fear your God. Verse 43, do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. And at the very end of chapter 25, again, it says, fear your God to, uh, to, to know God. And so this whole chapter is constantly uh, pulling back to God, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm making you return to your homes. I'm having you slow down. So you finally put me in the first place in your life. And when you do that, I give your, you your humanity back. Here's something we need to hear. God is willing for me to lose everything in my life if it means finding him. God is willing for me to lose everything in my life if it means finding him. I don't mean that as a metaphorical statement. I don't mean that as a trite statement. I mean that literally. I mean in this time right now, God will strip me of every single thing he's got to strip me of if it means I find him. Because the worst thing you could ever do, and Jesus said this last week, right? What good does it do to profit a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul? 
What good does it do if I get to the last breath of my life and I found everything except Jesus? God will strip me of everything to find him in this. And in that, I gain my humanity back. God knows that when I don't have him in the first place in my life, that I wind up worshiping idols. And the thing about idolatry is this, is it dehumanizes us. Psalm 115.8 says this, those who make idols will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. The psalmist is saying this, we become what we worship. We become what we worship. If we love money, we become greedy. If we love sex, we become a hedonist. If we love comfort, we become a slave to indulgence. If we love Jesus, we become like Jesus. Whatever we worship, we become like. And if it's anything other than God, there's a word for that, and it's called dehumanize. Idolatry makes us less human than what God designed us to be. And so God wants us to give our humanity back to us by putting him in the first place of our lives. So my prayer in this time, in this hiatus that we're in, is that God will reveal to us all the other lovers that we have run to besides him. All the other things I've tried to put in his place that while have given me maybe a temporary satisfaction will leave me thirsty and will leave me less of a human than God is I need to be. I pray God exposes that for our good and for his glory and to rescue us. The second thing you see in Leviticus 25 is it brought them back to their neighbors and family. Verse 14 there, it says, if you sell land to one of your countrymen or buy anything from them, do not take advantage of each other. Why would God feel the need to say that? Right? Well, because before the year of Jubilee, that's what was happening. People would take advantage of other people, right? They would sell property only thinking of profit. In other words, they would use their neighbors as a piece of commodity for them to get a benefit, right? There's a word for that, dehumanizing, to use someone else for our own benefit. So maybe in this time, what God's doing in some of our hearts is he's exposing how we use people. We don't love people. We use people. We use our family. We use our friends. We use coworkers for all different kinds of things in our lives. Maybe God's exposing our using of other people. Verse 35 in there, it says, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and unable to help themselves among you, help them as you would an alien or a temporary resident so they can continue to live among you. This is exactly the time we're in right now, right? In, in, in this pandemic with people losing jobs, it says, help them. Regain your humanity by helping your neighbors, right? This was said thousands of years ago. We need to hear this right now today. Go help the people around you and have more of a humanity by loving them and serving them and caring for them. Love your family, love your neighbors. You know, I think for some of us, what this season at home has done is it's exposed how we've neglected our families. It's a hard word to hear, but I wonder for some of us, that's what's been digging around our souls. That God is revealing everything else we've put above our families, our weekend plans, our hobbies, our uh, video games, our personal time, all the things we've gone after, our work, and we've neglected our families. And now that we're home, some of us are annoyed and frustrated and angry with them and upset and all those things. And, and all it is, is God's just showing us that we've neglected our families. We haven't put them first. And so my prayers for some of us is that we relearn what it looks like to love our kids. We relearn what it looks like to love our wives or to love our husbands or to love our grandkids. That we become human again. That we would love the people around us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love, that if I gain everything else in this world, if I'm killing it at work, and with my finances and with my achievements and everything else, but I'm not loving the people around me and I'm not loving God, it counts for nothing. It all winds up on an ash heap. I pray we become more human in this time by loving God and loving people. Okay, the second thing I want us to hear is that uh, this, I think, pandemic, this season gives us an opportunity to have something to say. An opportunity to have something to say. You know, I noticed a lot of people in our world are talking right now. So many voices on the news and on media and newspapers and blogs. But here's my question. Amongst all the talking, who's listening? 
And not who's listening to all the people talking, but I mean the people are talking, who are they listening to? And who are you listening to? Who are, who are I listening to? Oh, I'm doing a lot of talking right now. Who am I listening to to get the words that I have to say? Mark Buchanan, an author, pastor, said this, either God gives us words or we are only giving our opinions. Our speaking comes out of our listening. What we say comes out of what we hear. Either God gives us words or we are only giving our opinions. I don't know about you, but uh, I find it pretty difficult to hear from God when I'm running around, when I'm busy, when I'm occupied, when I'm trying to grasp, when I'm trying to strive, when I'm trying to run, when I'm busy and everything else going on, I don't really hear anything from God in that. It's when God stops us, it's when God slows us that we can hear him. I wonder if in all this, when we get out of this and we return back to normal life, I wonder if anybody will have something to really say. Something of value, something of meaning, something that they heard, something that God gave them so that I've got a word to speak. You know, I think in this time, maybe we ought to do a lot less talking and a lot more listening. Isn't this what Jesus did? Jesus says in John chapter 12, verses 49 through 50, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. I'm pretty sure of this. If Jesus had to listen to the Father to figure out what to say, I probably should too. Call me crazy. Seems like that's a, a good conclusion to come to. Yeah. Jesus says, the words that came out of my mouth were given to me by God, right? I know that his command leads to eternal life. I know that, that the other things I would say would not. It's God's commands that lead to eternal life. So whatever I say, whatever comes out of my mouth is only what I've been told what to say. And you know what Jesus did a lot of? A lot of slowing down a lot of going to private places to be alone, a lot of places where he would stop talking and just listen. Stop the business, stop the ministry, stop the activity, stop it all, and just listen to his father. And how badly we need this right now, how badly I need this right now, for God to speak into my soul so that you and I have got something to say of substance. Isaiah 40 Verse 8 says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Let it be said that if I am not saying something God's given me, my words are fallen to the ground and accomplish nothing. It is only God's words. Either God gives us words or we're only giving our opinions. Your and my words, our opinions, our comments, our uh, musings, our soapbox tirades, our lovely Facebook posts, our cleaned up Instagram shots, our pearls of wisdom, our nuggets of truth, our cheap platitudes, our unsolicited advice will all fade away if it's not breathed into us by God. The image I get in my mind is in the Old Testament of like a, a uh, worker, a farmer who goes into uh, the place to winnow his, his wheat to the threshing floor. And he would gather the wheat that he got in the day and he'd, and he'd take a pitchfork and he'd throw it up in the air. And, the, and what would happen is that the chaff, the, the part that was not used for food, would blow away in the wind and it would be gone. But what was edible, what had substance, would fall and would remain and stick. And that image is so powerful as you think about our words and our words that have not come to us by God are like those uh, chaff words that just blow away in the wind. But the words that we've got from God for something to speak will stay. They will stick in people's souls and people's minds. They will be effective for producing what God wants to produce in someone's life. Church, I pray that we're not just giving out a bunch of chaff. I pray we're giving wheat. And wheat only comes from God. And it only comes from hearing. And it only comes from slowing. It only comes from hearing what God has to say to me. Either God gives us words or we're only giving our opinions.
You know, the best example of this is Samuel in the Bible. You know, Samuel back in 1 Samuel is a little, a little boy and his mom who has prayed to God and becomes pregnant with him and says, if you give me a son, I'll bring him to the temple and I'll have him be the temple and he'll be trained up by Eli and I'll give him totally to you. I'll consecrate him to you. And so she does. She has Samuel, her son, and she takes him to the temple and she gives him to Eli there and he begins to get trained. And, and it's interesting because what it says in 1 Samuel 2.21 it says, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Then it says, uh, um, 1 Samuel 2, 26. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and favor with the Lord and with men. 1 Samuel 3, 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord. Samuel was doing all this work. He went to the temple. Uh, Eli, his, his coach, was there mentoring him and teaching him all these different things about the ministry and all the stuff he was doing. But then an interesting passage comes in 1 Samuel 3, 7. But Samuel did not yet know the Lord. What? We sort of trip over that statement. Wait a minute. He was doing all this stuff. But it says he did not yet know the Lord. And we learn a powerful truth in Scripture. And it's this. We can be very busy for God and still not know God. We can be very busy for God and still not know God. So maybe this time of the virus, maybe the slowing down is so that you might stop being busy for God and that you might get to know God. You might get to be intimate with him. You might get to uh, go deeper with him. You might get to love him more. You might get to spend time with him to listen to him. Eli taught Samuel a lot of good things, a lot of things in the temple, a lot of, a, a lot of administration, a lot of planning, a lot of coordinating, a lot of good skills he taught them. But the one thing he failed to teach him growing up was how to know God, how to listen to God, how to focus on God, right? It is only after that uh, Samuel is, is laying down one night and he's sleeping and uh, he hears someone calling him, Samuel. And he wakes up and he goes to Eli and he said, you know, Eli, you, you called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't. And then he goes, go, go back to bed. Samuel goes back to bed. The second time, Samuel hears, uh, you know, someone call his name. And he gets up and goes, Eli, you called. And says, no, I didn't. Go back to bed. He goes back to bed. A third time he hears, Samuel. And he, and he gets up, goes to Eli, you called me again. Samuel says, and Eli says, no, I didn't. And then he realizes, wait a minute, I think it's God. And he says, Samuel, go back to bed and wait and listen a fourth time. And then Samuel goes back to bed and a fourth time he says, Samuel, Samuel. And he wakes up and he says, God, I'm listening. And then God speaks and God speaks and God speaks to him. It says in 1 Samuel 3, 19, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word and Samuel's word came to all Israel. I don't think it's any accident that you hear a lot of things in here about God's word and Samuel speaking God's word. The sequence is so important. Samuel heard God, then he spoke for God. Samuel encountered God, then he had something to say for God. I wonder how many of us right now are in need of an encounter from God, are in need to hear from God, are in need for God to whisper something into our souls that has substance, substance and meaning for us to speak to those around us. It's not going to come by busyness. It's going to come by stopping. It's going to come by slowing. God empowered and animated and protected, and protected Samuel's words because Samuel heard, listened, and obeyed. And we ought to do the very same thing. God slows us to save us. He slows us to speak to us and through us. What voices are you listening to right now? What voices are you hearing? I, I read recently about um, this guy who was 17. And in high school, uh, he was driving home from a sporting event. He loved sports. He was all about sports. And he was driving home from a sporting event with his friend driving. And his friend uh, hit another car. And they got in a huge car crash. And this guy, the 17-year-old, flew out the window, fell on the ground, um, ripped open the side of his head, broke his back in two places. 
and he wound up um, sitting on the couch for two months to let his back heal. And uh, first thoughts were, God, how could you do this? God, how could you strip all these things away? And, and the doctor was saying, you may never walk again. You may never, of course, run again. And as he sat there and thought, my life's over and, and what's my purpose and where am I going to go? And all these things. And God, if you love me, why would you do this to me? But it was in this time where he's on his back, his life got disrupted, uh, got, got disjointed, got fractured, uh, got uh, this nuisance in his life. In the middle of all this, he had thought about a guitar and he asked for a guitar and he got a guitar during this time and he learned to play a guitar. And it was after this two month period that um, a new purpose, a new calling arose in his soul that he knew God was calling him to be a, a musician for the rest of his life. And he said, God put music and God put a new song in his heart. That 17 year old is Mike Donahue, who's the lead singer for 10th Avenue North. If you don't know 10th Avenue North, they're a band you've probably heard on 105.3 or all the, all the stations around the country who've traveled the globe, who've sold millions of records, now, um, singing songs about God, about Jesus, about uh, uh, the Lord and, and a loving God, all right? And all of it came. It all began when his life was interrupted and his life was put on hold for two months sitting on a couch and he had to hear God. He had to hear what God was saying to him. You know, my prayer is that uh, rather than what Governor Inslee said a week and a half ago, that uh, we would get back to normal life. My prayer is that we would come out of this changed. My prayer is that we would come out of this not normal, not unchanged, not get back to normal life. I pray we come out of this changed. But here's the thing, when God gives us a gift like he's given us today, it has to be opened. So my question to you today is, will you open this gift? Will you open this gift that God's giving us so that he might rescue us and he might change you and he might do a brand new work in your life or put a new song in your heart. God slows us to save us. Church, that's it. That's the, the message. Um, went a little bit longer today and so I hope you're able to hang with us. Uh, I'm going to pray and end and, and here, but I want you to know that uh, we love you, praying for you during the week. Please tune in this Wednesday night to our virtual prayer night. We'll send out another Zoom link for that that you can uh, watch, that you can uh, phone in as well and join with us there. And just praying for those who've lost jobs, for those who are sick, please join us in that. We would love to have that. And uh, know that you're being thought of, you're being prayed for. Again, reach out to an elder in your community, in your region, and really miss you guys a ton. So let me pray. And then we can uh, end. Lord God, we right now, Lord, I say thank you for this gift. God, I think of in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, where you say, it's your will that we would be thankful in all circumstances. Not the good circumstances, not the ones that bless our lives, but in all circumstances. So we say thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, we, we don't say thank you for the pandemic itself, but what you are going to do in and through us in this time. I pray, Lord, that you give us our humanity back. Let uh, those of us who have been robbed of our humanity, it's been stolen by our business and by our idolatry, that we would return to you and regain our humanity. Lord, and those of us who need to stop to have something to say, Lord, I pray, I pray that we come out of this with something to speak, something to say, a, a word with power to our family and friends and coworkers. We've got, we've got a word to speak. We've got something to say, God. Let our words not fall to the ground and turn to dust, but Lord, uh, let us not give our opinions, but let us give your word, God. Father, we need you so badly in this time, and I pray that we come out of this looking a lot more like Jesus and a lot less like ourselves. We love you. In your name, amen. All right. I can't see you, so I hope you're out there somewhere in virtual space. And uh, God bless. Again, love you, and we'll see you next Sunday. Okay, signing off.